Michael Schrag, for the, anybody here was at the Kobe meeting, Ted Ford Kobe? Okay. Michael did that daily newspaper there, that, gar that amazing, amazing daily newspaper there. We worked 28 hours a day producing it. I had nothing to do with it. He did it. It was terrific. Michael Schrag. Thank you very much. Um, that, that, was, that was a great fun. I really appreciated the opportunity to do that. I was the, uh, apparently the one speaker who didn't send in my photo, so I am portrayed by a full frontal artichoke over there. Richard has declined to explain the symbolism of that, and I'm not going to ask. Um, I heard what the senator said. I, I don't, didn't play basketball, don't play the trumpet but I love playing with ideas and there's an idea that I've been involved with with uh, Merrill Lynch that I would like to share with you. I care a great deal about this idea and I think in many respects it embodies a lot of the values of, of risk and innovation and design and technology and entertainment and education that, that we all care so deeply about. Um, and to discuss the idea I'd like to create a bit of a historical context for it. If, if you can put the slide on please. You all know who this is? Charles Lindbergh, Lucky Lindy, the Lone Eagle, flew across the Atlantic, I mean, Time Mag at first, and Time's first a man of the year for flying across. And you all, you all know why he flew across the Atlantic? No, it wasn't to get to the other side, although <laughs> it's a good thing he would, wouldn't have gotten the credit if he hadn't, but there's a lot of talk about romance of it. The, you know, the, the Lone Eagle just, the idea of crossing the Atlantic and, and it's perceived as an incredibly romantic thing. And it was, but, but what was the spark? What was the motivator? I'm not exactly right. Somebody said the RT Prize. It's a check. It's a check for $25,000. So the resolution is good, signed by Raymond Ortigue. Raymond Ortigue was a Parisian restaurateur who thought seven years prior that it would be kind of an interesting thing to do something to encourage that kind of innovation, that kind of bold risk taking. And here was, here was Lindbergh getting the funding. Spirit of St. Louis flew across. So for all the discussion of the romance of this, there was, there was a prize, cash prize, associated with it. Let's jump ahead a few decades. As a, perhaps some of you may recognize a younger version of the gentleman who's attending here, Paul McCready. Gossamer Condor, Gossamer Albatross, flew the figure eight and flew across the English Channel. The reason was, and outside of the fact that he's a brilliant engineer, what was the instigator, the motivator, the spark, the catalyst? It was the prize from Henry Kramer. 50,000 pounds and 100,000 pounds. Real money. Now, Paul wasn't kind enough to give me a copy of the check that he received, but I'll sort of put that up. Go further back. Is this a familiar name? Familiar picture? This is, for those of you who read David Sabel's book, Longitude, this is John Harrison, the fellow who labored for, for decades to invent the chronometer to win the prize board of, from the Board of Longitude in the 1700s, a 20,000 pound prize in the 1700s, which according to one of the, the sources was, translates into a prize worth $12 million. Uh, in fact, this guy, you may remember him from American history, King George III, mad King George, had to interview to actually get the money awarded to, to John Harrison. But why did the guy slave away for 20 years to try to do this? There's a huge prize associated with it. I mean, what do these prizes do? They make a market where a market otherwise wouldn't have existed. The design of a prize enables you to design a market. And I find that really interesting because if the marketplace, sure there's marketplace of things, but as the senator pointed out, there's marketplaces of meanings, there's marketplaces of ideas. How do you design a prize? How do you design prizes that really encourage new kinds of ideas and new kinds of innovations? And that's something that I've thought an awful lot about, and I think it's something that really, that really matters. We're in a knowledge-driven economy. I mean, in, in some respects, we've always been in a knowledge-driven economy. But we've been in a, we're in a knowledge-driven economy, and one of the things we need to do is figure out if you care about investing, if you care about the future, what are the undervalued assets in a knowledge economy? Where, where might there be untapped value 
Where might there be untapped creativity that can really make a difference in people's lives? I'm going to give you a number. The number is 44,000. Anyone want to have, no, it's not a prime number. Anybody want to hazard a guess what, what this number represents? It's the number of PhDs awarded in the United States in 1995. Actually, that was kind of a large number, but if it makes you feel any better, there were more legal degrees awarded. <laughs> that wasn't a cell phone, I hope. 44,000 PhDs. Now, you gotta figure, look at the motivations that a lot of the people have for doing the, these PhDs. You know, they want to get it past the thesis committee. But to get a PhD, to do the research that you're doing, you become, your, your, your goal is to advance the boundaries of knowledge. But you know the joke about a generalist is somebody who studies more and more about less and less, and, uh, uh, sorry, a generalist knows less and less about more and more until, until they know nothing about everything, and a specialist knows more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. There has to be some sort of a balance involved here. And a lot of the people who are at the very cutting edge of knowledge are the people who have oftentimes the least time and the least incentive to explore the implications of their work beyond their specialty beyond their expertise. And that is a crime, that is an undervalued asset. And so the question has to be, how do we make a market to appreciate an undervalued asset? How do we tap into something that I believe, and the people at Merrill Lynch believe, and pr presumably a lot of the people here believe is, you've spent five or six years of your life really defining that. Now, some of you guys are going to become entrepreneurs. You look at a company like Sun, you look at a company like Cisco, you look at Genentech, and you see these kinds of rich transfers, technology transfers between academia and the conventional marketplace. But if you look in the field of linguistics, statistics, philosophy, in design, where are the incentives for these sorts of things? So how do you make a market to appreciate an undervalued asset? The answer that we, one of the answers that we're coming up with is the Merrill Lynch Innovation Grants Competition. And what we have done, we've got some of the most terrific, provocative, smart people in the world to agree to be judges. People include people here, John Seeley Brown from Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Esther Dyson, John Doerr, Peter Goldmark, the former head of the Rockefeller Foundation, Arati Prabhaktar from, from Raychem, Bill Hazeltine from Human Genome Sciences. It's a, it's a very interesting, the, our judges are really one of our assets. And their goal, what we're asking university PhD candidates to do is to not submit their thesis, God forbid. In fact, that was the conditions that people agreed to be judges, but not to read the thesis. <laughs> we're, we're asking people to take, to take a step back and encourage candidates to look at their research with new eyes and new incentives. And that is to ask a series of very simple questions about what are the implications of their work? You know, what's, what's the counterpart of being a Harrison? What's the counterpart? of being a McCready or a Lindbergh? What's the, what, what's the implication of what it is you're doing that can give meaning in a way that you had not anticipated meaning when you began that research, when you began that work, when you began that dissertation? And I think that's very, very significant. And we, we're offering top prize of $50,000, which is significantly less than the Board of Longitude and, and, and Kramer. But the goal is not to turn doctoral students into entrepreneurs. That's, that's a ridiculous thing. We're not trying to do wholesale conversion of the academy. The goal basically is to ask people to become a little more literate, a little more appreciative of market forces, and more importantly, of the value of their own work. And so it really is to get people to look at, at their work with new eyes and new incentives. And the reason why we have people like Peter Goldmark on the board is that we don't want, it, I'll consider this and will consider this at Merrill Lynch to be a total failure if the only people who win are people from electrical engineering and molecular biology or computer science. We're looking for people from linguistics and statistics and philosophy and psychology and education and design. And, and frankly, we're looking at this as venture capital for the mind. We want people to go beyond their expertise to provide meaning and insight for a broader group of people, to make their work accessible to more people. And one of the reasons why I'm here is to say that this is one of the best communities in the world and it's because you can be sure that we will be asking your help to be scouts, to communicate this to potential candidates, and indeed to suggest judges and to be judges. And one of the concerns that I have right now uh, as, I, as I pursue this with, with people is 
I'm, I'm in a very dangerous place because I actually feel like I know what I'm doing, and that is the most dangerous position for me to be in. So I will be uh, soliciting your help and advice and counsel in this regard. And I would like people like, like Paul McCready to be judges for this competition. And I would like the people in this room to think twice about who are the bright people who, if they only had the incentive and the time to rethink their work a little bit, might be willing to be a little more innovative. This is our website. This is our address for people to download applications and get more information. I think it's a really exciting opportunity for people to go beyond their expertise and create new kinds of meaning and new kinds of value to communities that they hadn't thought about when they began their work. I'd like to thank you for your time. Take care.